international arms race is a fact. Here on Visual Politic, we have already told you about how countries like Australia, Poland, Germany, and Japan are announcing sharp increases in their military spending. The list is long. However, in order for so many Western countries to rearm at the same time, not only more money is needed, but also sufficient industrial and technological capacity to be able to manufacture and deliver all the requested equipment in a timely manner. And keep in mind that, although this may seem obvious to us, huge orders and volumes. To give you an idea, in the fortnight from 15th of July to August 2 alone, the US military industry finalized contracts for almost $20 billion worth of arms and military equipment sales to other countries. In other words, Washington committed to arms sales at a rate of more than $1 billion a day. And of course, this is just one example. HIMARS, F-35 fighters, missiles, torpedoes, howitzers, tanks, armored vehicles, practically the entire catalog of US conventional weapons are selling like hotcakes. In other words, their sales have skyrocketed. <laughs> The demand is off the charts. Among other things, it's because if the war in Ukraine has shown anything, it is that A. Western countries need stronger armies, and B. American weapons are still the top choice, and that's by a long shot. The problem is that the production capacity of the US military industry is obviously not without its limits. It takes time to adapt an entire production line to such a large and sudden demand. So of course, all this in addition to the efforts that the United States itself is making to supply Ukraine with weapons has a very clear drawback. Delivery times. Taiwan is buying US weapons, but Washington isn't delivering them. This is just one example, but delivery delays and endless waiting lists have become the norm. And then there is another problem. American weapons may be the creme de la creme, but they're also terribly expensive. Not only in terms of selling price, but also typically in terms of the cost of using them. These two factors are pushing many countries to look for alternatives, technologically advanced alternatives. The problem is that there are not so many options. But guess what? Right here is where a new player is emerging. Check it out. Philippines to receive weapons, equipment from South Korea. Egypt emerges as new market for Korean arms exports. Poland, South Korea sign multi-billion arms contract. The Philippines, Egypt, Poland, Norway, Australia, United Arab Emirates, Finland, Estonia, Turkey. No matter which continent we are talking about, more and more countries are turning their attention to South Korean weapons in order to modernize or supplement their armed forces. It even appears that Washington intends to purchase tens of thousands of advanced South Korean projectiles for the Ukrainian artillery. So the questions seem clear. Why South Korea? Why a country such as Poland, for example, betting so heavily on this market? Is it simply a question of timing or price? What could all this mean for capitalist South Korea? <laughs> Well, in this video, we're going to give you all the clues as to why this country is becoming a key player, one of the new giants of the global military industry. And believe me, when I tell you that what we are going to show in this video is very likely to surprise you. Listen up. Necessity breeds invention. The South Korean military industry is experiencing a huge boom, an unprecedented takeoff. It is undoubtedly entering its golden age. South Korea poised to become number four defense exporter. Korea was ranked ninth in terms of the global defense export volume in 2021, according to KIET. This year's exports would push Korea up to fourth place, trailing defense powerhouses the US, Russia, and France. In other words, South Korea may have already surpassed China itself. Specifically, by the end of 2022, the South Koreans estimate they will have finalized nearly $20 billion in arms export deals, well above the $15 billion target set by the government. The question is, is this a one-off spike caused by the war in Ukraine? Well, if you believe that, pay close attention to these data. According to SIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, South Korean defense exports increased 177% in the 2017 to 2021 five-year period compared to the previous five-year period. And take note because this is the highest growth rate of the military industry worldwide. This is almost three times the progress of France, which was the country second on the list for increasing its military exports the most, with a 59% increase over the same period of time. Meanwhile, other major exporters, such as China and the United Kingdom, reduced their sales by 31 and 41% respectively. As you can see, with these data in hand, it seems clear that the growth of the South Korean military industry is not the result of a temporary upturn, but of a very marked trend. Of course, as you can imagine, achieving such growth in military exports is not something that can happen overnight. <laughs> Behind all this data and all these headlines lies a long road of multi-million dollar investments, both from large South Korean corporations and from the state itself. Investments in both capacity as well as research, development, and innovation. Of course, in South Korea's case, all these investments were not designed to boost military exports, as has been the case with other industries in the land of K-pop, such as, for example, automobiles. No, in this case, defense investments were made primarily with national defense in mind. And this, visual politic viewers, is what makes the South Korean military industry such a special case. <laughs> You see, after the armistice that indefinitely halted the Korean War in 1953, the South Korean army was in ruins. Practically disarmed and exhausted, Seoul became almost exclusively dependent on the United States for its defense. For this reason, the South Koreans not only welcomed tens of thousands of US troops on their territory, along with numerous nuclear warheads, but also became preferred customers of the US military industry. And this was true for about two decades. The South Korean military was set up, operationally, command and hardware-wise, as a sort of scaled-down reproduction of the US military itself. 
Not so fast, however, because in the 1970s, something was to happen that would change everything in one fell swoop. In 1969, the so-called Nixon Doctrine and the opening up to China led to a massive partial withdrawal of US troops from Asia. Give you an idea. In the two years between 1969 and 1971 alone, the United States went from having more than 727,000 troops stationed in Asia to having only 284,000. South Korea's reduction was from 63,000 to 43,000 US troops in the same time period. And naturally, put yourselves in their shoes. This could not be reassuring for a country that remained under the active threat from North Korea. We're talking about much higher levels of harassment than today. Back then, espionage, violent coercion, kidnappings, and assassination attempts by North Korean commandos were the order of the day. Not to mention, of course, a gigantic army in numbers supported by the Soviet Union. <laughs> In 1968, for example, North Korea attempted, with a special forces commando, to storm the Blue House, which, until recently, was the official residence and office of the president, in order to assassinate the South Korean leader. So, of course, under the circumstances, it is not surprising that President Park Chung-hee said that this withdrawal was a message to the South Korean people, that if there was another invasion, the Americans would no longer rescue them. And all this despite the fact that the South Koreans wanted to return the favor to the United States for its help in the Korean War by sending more than 312,000 troops to the Vietnam War to help Uncle Sam. Washington's withdrawal came as a blow to Seoul. South Korea became increasingly fearful that, if necessary, Washington would look the other way. The alliance with the United States was indispensable, but it was not enough by itself. They had to get down to work in order to get themselves out of danger. So what did Seoul do? Well, yes, exactly what you're thinking. They took every last one they could get out of their wallets, and local arms manufacturers started receiving huge loans and tax breaks. Exactly the same thing happened with the steel, shipbuilding, and electronics industries, which were considered strategic and benefited greatly from this new policy. You could say that South Korea is one of those cases in which the military industry contributed to the industrial development of the country. The point is that, in this way, what happened is that little by little, the South Koreans went from depending on supplies from the United States to manufacturing a large part of their own weapons. They started with simple things like US licensed rifles, and then upped the ante until they had one of the most extensive and advanced catalogues of weapons and equipment in the world. But wait a minute, because obviously visual politics is not a history channel. But what can I say? We couldn't talk about what the new military industrial giant is like now without some explanation for how they got there. So do you want to know exactly what South Korea's military industry has to offer to the world? Why are more and more countries making a firm commitment to this new supplier? Well. Let's take a look. The birth of a military giant. We saw it at the beginning of the video. Poland has recently signed multi-million dollar contracts for the purchase of armaments from South Korea. We are talking about nothing less than Warsaw signing a whopping 14.7 billion, with a B, in new orders to the South Korean military complex in 2022 alone. And take note because more money is on the way. And do you know what this means? It means that what is set to be one of the largest NATO armies in Europe, if not the largest of all, will be largely and even mainly equipped with South Korean weapons. Poland needed weapons to defend itself and that is exactly what we are providing. We Koreans understand that without weapons to defend ourselves, the end result is a tragedy. Chun Im Bum, former lieutenant General in the South Korean army. In total, Poland will have 1,000 K2 Black Panther tanks, 48 Kai FA 50 fighters, almost 700 K9 Thunder self propelled howitzers, and 288 K239 Chunmu multiple rocket launcher systems in the coming years. We'll tell you more about that last one in a moment, but the question now is why is Poland going to rebuild its armed forces with South Korean weapons? Well, there are four main reasons for this. The first, of course, is the speed of delivery. <laughs> To give you an idea, less than three months after the purchase of K2 tanks and K9 self-propelled howitzers was signed, Poland was already receiving the first shipment. Specifically, the South Koreans managed to deliver the first 10 K2 tanks and 24 K9 howitzers to Poland in record time. And why the big hurry? Because among other things, this allowed Poland to continue supplying Ukraine with Soviet equipment. First delivery of South Korean heavy weapons comes to Poland. The quick pace of this delivery is of crucial importance in the face of Russian aggression and the war in Ukraine. Polish President Andrzej Duda. But how is it possible for South Korean industry to have such fast delivery times? Well, this is basically possible thanks to the fact that this country is a huge industrial powerhouse that also has a very active military sector, not least because it is constantly producing to meet the demand of the South Korean armed forces itself. Another advantage is their greater ease of finding supplies. To give an example, modern weapons are equipped with a lot of very complex systems that need a huge amount of chips. And guess what? South Korea is the world's second largest semiconductor producer just behind Taiwan. They basically turned themselves into a one-stop shop. The South Korean defense industry has strong and stable ties with its suppliers, including semiconductor manufacturers. That's the advantage of having a large industrial base. You have easier access to all kinds of components and supplies. This is one of the main reasons why Poland will almost certainly be able to receive 180 Korean-made K2 tanks and 212 K9 howitzers by the end of 2025 or early 2026. But wait a minute, Josh, didn't you tell us before about 1,000 tanks and almost 700 howitzers? Well, yes, well spotted. And here we come precisely to the second reason why buying arms from South Korea is much more attractive than from other major exporters. Do you understand what I mean? Well, the South Koreans are very flexible when it comes to authorizing the manufacture of their weapons abroad through licensing. Business is business. 
unlike the United States, which is very restrictive in allowing its advanced military technologies to be manufactured outside the country, the South Koreans have no major problems with that issue. Let's just say that their primary goal is to win the contracts. And so, after 